Hey students, in this video, I'll be touching on the topic of the water cycle. We'll be looking at four main guiding questions. Why is water important? What are the three states of water? How is the water cycle applicable? And finally, what is water pollution? So, what are you waiting for? Hop on and join me as I embark on the journey of learning about the water cycle. To start off, why is water so important? All living things, including plants and animals, need water to survive. Fun fact, water is used by your body to keep your body at a steady temperature. It would be too dangerous for your body if your body temperature changes too much. Very quickly, let's move on to the next guiding question. What are the three states of water? Before we discuss about the three states of water, let's recap. Water is matter as it occupies space and has mass. Water has three states. Solid, which exists as ice. Liquid, which is water. And gas, which is water vapour or steam. You may be wondering, what's the difference between steam and water vapour? Water vapour is a gaseous form of liquid water, while steam is a very hot water vapour that is obtained during boiling. Take note that both steam and water vapour cannot be seen by the naked eye. If you see mist evolving from boiling water, what you are actually seeing is hot water vapour that has come into contact with the much cooler air above it, lost heat to it, and condensed to form very tiny water droplets that you see in the form of mist. We will find out more about condensation later. Hmm, but how exactly does water be converted into different states? Does magic happen? How about we look at how heat affects the state of water? Here is an overview of water and changes of its state. Let's start from ice, which is water at solid state. When the solid ice gains heat and melts to liquid water, this change is called a change of state. Similarly, when water evaporates to water vapour or boils into steam, there is conversion of liquid state to gaseous state. When steam and water vapour form water, we say that it has condensed into water. And yes, you guessed it, when water changes into solid ice, it is freezing. Here, notice that the red, dark red arrows represent a gain of heat, while the light blue arrows represent a loss of heat. We shall find out more about each of the five processes in the subsequent slides. During melting, heat is gained. The heat gain converts liquid solid ice into liquid water, and this happens at the melting point which is 0 degrees Celsius for water. Take note that the solid melting point is equal to its liquid freezing point. We will elaborate on this in the later slides. It is also important to take note that during melting, temperature stays at the same temperature, the melting point, until all solid or ice has melted. In other words, as the ice is melting, its temperature, as well as all the liquid near the melting ice, remains at 0 degrees Celsius. And moving on to boiling. Boiling involves the gain of heat, where liquid water is converted into steam, which is gas. Boiling occurs at the boiling point of a substance, which is 100 degrees Celsius in the case of water. Like melting, temperature stays at the same temperature, which is the boiling point, until all liquid has boiled. In fact, even the steam that is invisible to the eye near the boiling liquid water would remain at 100 degrees Celsius until all the liquid water has boiled. And next, evaporation. When liquid water gains heat to form water vapour, which is that gaseous state, we say that a change of state has occurred. However, it is important to realise that evaporation occurs at any temperature at any time, below the boiling point. 
Because at the boiling point, when water is converted into water vapour, we say that boiling has occurred, not evaporation. Have you witnessed this before? When you accidentally spill water onto the ground, after some time, the ground becomes dry. Why is this so? Yes, you guessed it. That's because the liquid water has converted into water vapour which exists in gaseous state. Hmm, but if evaporation occurs at any temperature, does that mean that it also occurs in the freezing cold environment? Before we answer the question, let's talk about what affects the rate of evaporation or how fast or slow evaporation happens. The four factors affecting the rate of evaporation include wind, humidity, exposed surface area, and temperature. Notice that the underlined alphabets form the word what. This is an effective study tip that you can use to remember the factors affecting the rate of evaporation. Firstly, wind is a factor that affects the rate of evaporation. The stronger the wind, the faster the rate of evaporation. When you get something wet, such as your worksheets, do you realize that you will subconsciously place them near a fan so that it dries more quickly? Yes, that's because evaporation happens more quickly when there is stronger wind. Secondly, humidity affects the rate of evaporation. This is a factor that is good to know, although it may not be in your syllabus right now, but still good to know. The greater the humidity, the slower the rate of evaporation. For example, do you ever wonder why on cloudy days when it's not sunny and after you perspire heavily after an exercise, you find your skin sticky and wet to the touch? But in contrast, on a very hot day, you realize that your skin may feel dry to touch although you are perspiring heavily. Why is this so? Yes, humidity has come to play. For instance, on a cloudy day when it is very humid, the gaseous particles in the air come closer together near your skin, making it difficult for your perspiration to evaporate quickly and help you feel cooler. Next, the exposed surface area of an object also affects the rate of evaporation. The greater the, greater the exposed surface area, the faster the rate of evaporation. For instance, when you accidentally spill water onto a stack of worksheets, it would make more sense to separate the pieces of paper to dry them more quickly, right? Similarly, when you separate the sheets of paper, you are in fact increasing the exposed surface area to wind and air all around the worksheets. Note that the exposed surface area is the outer surfaces of objects the parts you can touch. And finally, temperature also plays a role in the rate of evaporation. The higher the temperature, the faster the rate of evaporation. On a hot day, do you realize that when you spill water onto the ground, the ground dries up so much more quickly? And back to our question on whether evaporation happens even in the freezing cold environment. Yes, it still does. but Evaporation happens so, so slowly that you may not even notice any change to your spilled water on the ground. Before we continue, let us look at the difference between evaporation and boiling. Both involves a change of state from liquid to gas and involves the gain of heat. The difference is that evaporation occurs at any temperature below boiling point, while boiling occurs only at boiling point which is 100 degrees Celsius for water. Moving on to the fourth process of water and changes of its state, freezing. Freezing occurs at freezing point, which is 0 degrees Celsius for water, where liquid water is converted to solid ice. As mentioned earlier, a liquid's freezing point is equal to its solid's melting point, and this will be elaborated further later in a graph, look out for it. Like melting and boiling, temperature stays at the same temperature, which is at freezing point, until all liquid has frozen. 
Finally, condensation is a change of state of water from water vapour, which is gas, to liquid, water. When you exhale into a mirror, what do you see? Notice that the mirror turns foggy. When you touch the foggy mirror with your finger, do you realise that the surface of the mirror feels wet? This is because condensation has occurred. Condensation occurs every time gas at a higher temperature comes into contact with a surface that is cooler, that is, at a lower temperature. In the previous example, the air you breathe out comes from your body, which is at a higher body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, while the surface of the mirror is at a much cooler temperature of about 27 degrees Celsius at room temperature. Let's see if we can explain why condensation has occurred in the next slide. For example, let's imagine you are in a car when you noticed that the window seems foggy. Why is this so? That's because condensation has happened. As the inside of the car is cold, assuming that the air conditioner is turned on, the outer surface of the windows of the car becomes cool. The warmer air particles of the atmosphere, which is at a higher temperature of 35 degrees Celsius, comes into contact with the cooler outer surface of the window, which is at about 23 degrees Celsius. Thus, the water vapour, which is a gas, in the surroundings, which in this case, for example, is at 35 degrees Celsius, loses heat and condenses onto the outside of the window surface as water droplets causing the window to look foggy on the outer surface of the window. Using the same explanation, can you explain why the mirror turned foggy? Time for a summary. When ice is heated, it melts and changes to water at 0 degrees Celsius. When water is cooled, it freezes and changes to water at 0 degrees Celsius. When water is heated, it boils and changes to steam at 100 degrees Celsius. When steam is cooled, it changes and condenses into water at temperatures below 100 degrees Celsius. Take note that the difference between steam and water vapour is that water vapour can form through evaporation which occurs at any temperature. On the other hand, Steam is only formed when water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. As for condensation, it occurs whenever there is a difference in temperature between the hotter gaseous water vapour or steam and the cooler surface of another object, which can be solid or gas surface. You will learn more about this in the topic of heat energy. Before we move on, here's a quick question to recap what we have learned. Is this steam? No. Remember that steam and water vapour cannot be seen by the naked eye. The mist that you see when water is boiling is actually tiny water droplets which are in liquid state, not gaseous state. When water boils, liquid water changes its state in gas, steam. The steam comes into contact with the cooler air surface about or above it, lose heat to it, and is condensed into tiny water droplets in the form of mist. Now, let's take a look at this graph. When ice gains heat from point A to B, it reaches 0 degrees Celsius, the melting point. At this point, at, that is at B, it starts to melt where solid ice is converted to liquid water. As heating continues from B to C, the whole ice cube must melt before the temperature can rise again from C. For example, no matter how big your ice cube is, the temperature is still the same at 0 degrees Celsius. Thus, when it starts to melt, the ice is still there and it is only becoming smaller. So, when temperature stays the same, uh, so temperature still stays the same. We can think of this as, when ice melts, it is gaining heat. However, the heat is used to help the particles in ice break away from each other for the ice to be converted into liquid water. So, the temperature of melting ice stays the same at 0 degrees Celsius. When all the ice has finally melted at point C, 
the liquid water goes continues to gain heat and the temperature of water rises from point C to D. This happens until it reaches the water's boiling point at point D. This happens when water turns to steam at 100 degrees Celsius. At this point, all water must become steam, as shown from points B D to E. Therefore, the temperature stays the same at, from points D to E. As mentioned earlier, always remember that evaporation happens at all temperatures at any time. This is regardless of whether the ice is still melting, that is, it hasn't fully melted to water, for instance, evaporation is still happening. It happens as long as there is a temperature difference between, say, the surrounding air and the liquid from the melting ice. You will learn more about this in the topic of heat transfer, as mentioned earlier. Likewise, from point C to D, although the water is not boiling yet, evaporation is still occurring. So, how can we apply what we have learned to the water cycle? What is the water cycle? The water cycle is continuous production and usage of water in our natural environment. It is the only way we can get fresh water to drink. Let's take a look at this beautiful diagram. Evaporation of water, which occurs at all times of the day, condenses into water droplets that collect together in the air to form clouds. Then, when the clouds become too heavy, the water droplets fall back to the water bodies on Earth as precipitation which means rain or snow or hail. Water bodies here refer to places where water accumulates, such as the sea, river, lake, and many more. It is important to know that the clouds you see in the air are not made of gaseous particles. They are made of very tiny water droplets that collect together to form a large cloud that you see in the sky. Remember that gaseous particles cannot be seen. These gaseous particles that I've mentioned include steam and water vapour. Hmm, ever heard of the people around you talking about water pollution? What's that? Water pollution occurs when harmful su substances such as chemicals like oil and bacteria enter the water bodies like lakes, sea, oceans and many more. How does water pollution affect me? Well, when large amounts of contaminated water, which is water that has been polluted and has become dirty, is accidentally ingested or drunk, it can become harmful for our bodies. We may end up sick and with a bad stomach ache. For example, even the food we eat may sometimes carry bits of chemicals and dirt from the contaminated water. Most of our food comes from overseas plantations, which use a lot of water from free water bodies. These water bodies may be contaminated. So, what can you and I do to reduce water pollution? Some examples include Do not pour fat from cooking oil or chemicals down the sink or toilet bowls. Instead, throw them away with the solid waste. Encourage your parents or adults to reduce the use of bleach on laundry. The water that rinses the bleach out from your clothes may get washed down into reservoirs or water bodies and contaminate water. Lastly, dispose trash properly, not into any water body you see. And with that, let's recap the four main guiding questions that we have gone through. Can you answer all of them? Water is important because all living things need water to survive. This includes plants. The three states of water are solid, ice, liquid water, and gas, which is water vapour or steam. There are a total of five main processes that change the state of water. Can you name all of them? What about the four factors that affect the rate of evaporation? Do you remember the acronym WHAT? And next, the basic water cycle involves three steps, evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. 
Finally, water pollution occurs when water gets contaminated with dirt or bacteria. And before we end off, it's quiz time! Pause the video to attempt the questions on your own. When you are done, play the video to check your answers. For the question on the left, the answer is 4. At the 4th minute, there is a mixture of ice and water, or at the 20th minute, there is a mixture of water and water vapour. The temperature is still below 100 degrees Celsius at the 20th minute. Therefore, steam is absent. Recall that evaporation occurs at any time below boiling point. Thus, at the 20th minute, Water vapour is also present. And for the question on the right, the answer of part A reads, The hot water in the bottle evaporated into water vapour inside the bottle and came into contact with the cooler inner surface of the plastic sheet. The water vapour loses heat and condenses into water droplets which fall back into the bottle. And the answer for part B reads, there was not enough warm water vapour that evaporated from the cold water to come into contact with the cooler surface of the plastic sheet. Did you get them right? And that's the end of this video. Thank you for watching. Before we end off, we would like to thank Gabriel for his tremendous guidance in the production of this video as well as Ko Yang and Well and Care Center for providing us with this opportunity to help you. See you in our next video. Have fun learning! This video is brought to you by Project Love of Learning by students from Hua Chong Institution.